We, as people, we live in a day where people often compromise. In fact, I believe that from the time we began our lives in this world, we have learned the art of compromising. We also see in the scriptures men and women who have compromised. For example, we see David, he compromised his morals and his divine standards of God. He adulterated Bathsheba and he murdered her husband Uriah and he lost his child. Solomon compromised his conviction. I heard this morning you guys talking about Solomon. Solomon compromised his conviction. He married foreign wives and lost the United Kingdom. Ahaz, that's another king, compromised and married Jezebel. Yes, there's a woman in the Bible called Jezebel. Married Jezebel and lost his throne. Israel compromised the law of God with sin and adultery and lost the promised land. Peter compromised his conviction about Christ Denied the Lord three times, and he lost his joy. Ananias and Sapphira had compromised the word of, of God by lying to the Holy Spirit, and unfortunately they lost their lives. Judas compromised his supposed love for Jesus and sold our Lord for 30 pieces of silver and lost his eternal soul. Compromised church is a, is a very sad word. But there are those that did not compromise, amen. There are some people who have no price. There are some who can't be bought. Moses before Pharaoh, Paul before Festus, Felix, and, and Agrippa, and Daniel before uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, Ananias, Mishael, and Azariah before King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to be looking at three points this morning, quickly. Today's sermon is called, The Result of an Uncompromised Life. The Result of an Uncompromised Life. We're going to be looking at three points. Point number one, Daniel had an unashamed boldness. Point number two, Daniel had an unearthly protection, verse number 9. And point number 3, Daniel had an unblemished faith. Now when we look at the background here in the book of Daniel, we find the story of Daniel and his friends. It was about 605 BC, approximately 125 years after King Hezekiah had died. Remember when we talked about Hezekiah? And we talked about the Assyrians who came and tried to destroy our Judah. God can use a foreign nation, and he does, as an instrument of his wrath against his people. Yes. And so we see that Assyrian, they, they charged against Judah, right? And they took the, the fortified cities except Jerusalem. Right? And Assyria was led by Sennacherib. Later on, now, 125 years later, we find another nation now. And this nation is called the Babylonians. Assyria is gone. They are destroyed. Ezekiah is in the grave. Now, you have another power nation known as the Babylonian Empire. And they are being led by King Nebuchadnezzar. He comes to destroy the southern nation, Judah. Once again, Judah. And the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1, verse number 1, follow me please, he says he besieged it. When he was finally in control, the Bible tells us that, that, that in Daniel chapter 1, and verse 4, that he ordered the wisest and the healthiest and the most good-looking young men of royal families and he brought them back to his kingdom. And he brought them back for service. Among those we find is Daniel, known as Belshazzar. And you have Ananias, known as Shadrach. 
Mishael known as Meshach and Azariah known as Abednego. We know him as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? The beloved say that. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar's motive was to brainwash these children. So what he did was he ordered their names to be changed. That's not something that is uncommon. We see it in history. So that they could have no connection to Judah. Then he wanted them to be educated in the Babylonian schools. To learn their philosophies, if you will. They were being attacked upon every side, every angle. And the final thing that he wanted to do to brainwash them was, verse 5, to feed them a daily portion of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. And of course, that's where Daniel what? That's where Daniel drew the line. Amen. You see, you can change my name. And that won't affect me. Amen. As a matter of fact, majority of us here have names that have no biblical meaning. I've looked it up. My wife's name, for example, today, is a Nigerian name that means honor. It's nice, but it's not it, it, it will quote unquote biblical name. Right? So many of us here have names that, 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 that have no biblical connotation, if you will. Then he wanted them to be educated, like, as, as I said, in, in, in the schools. And he wanted them to partake, if you will, of their delicacies. And that's where, that's where Daniel and his friends draw the line. You can feed me your philosophy. Again, you can change my name. That's all right. You can feed me your philosophy in your educational setting. And that's okay. But as long as I'm filtering that information through the word of God, that is okay. Amen. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 7 and verse number 22 that Moses was what? Educated in all the wisdom of Egypt. Amen. And was powerful in speech and in action. Luke says, Moses learned the way of the Egyptian. God said, that's okay. You could learn the things of the world. As long as you're filtering through the word of God. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. But if I am conforming to the patterns, amen, if I'm conforming to the patterns of this world, if I'm doing what the culture does, if I'm consuming the things of the culture, then I'm compromising my beliefs. And at that point, we have to draw the line. And that is where Daniel draws the line as well. When we live a life that does not compromise, that does not fall prey to the lifestyles of this world, that does not sell out any, at any price, you will find, point number one, an unashamed boldness. Let's read for me, please. Verse number eight, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank, Therefore, he requested that the chief of eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Twice the word defiled is used in that one scripture there. The word defiled carries the meaning of polluting or staining or soiling something. So in other words, Daniel was saying to the chief official here, he was saying, tell the king, let me connect up, that I won't be eating his food. <laughs> I won't be drinking this drink because it's going to pollute my body. It's going to pollute me. It's going to sting me. It's going to soil me. That was bold. That was bold. There would have been a lot of other things that he could have said. That would have been easier. He didn't have to be so blatant, if you will. He didn't have to be so harsh. But one of the, one of the characteristics of an uncompromised life is the boldness to speak where God speaks. Amen. 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 The boldness to speak the truth, no matter how harsh it sounds. And Daniel did just that. He could have him and he could have harmed. Okay, what is that? <laughs> he could have harmed his way through, but he did not do that. He could have made up excuses. He could have beat around the bush. 
so to speak. He could have, um, you see what happened is when I drink the grape, the, 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 the wine, it, I have allergies, right? So it, it, it hurts my throat. He could have armed his way through. Because when I eat the, the, the meat or eat the food, you know what happened is my, my stomach hurt. So please can you just exempt us from eating the, the, the king's delicacies? And you know many times when we get to a situation that is really a spiritual issue, we give reason all that than what the Bible says. Amen. We don't want to admit that it's against our beliefs. Somebody says, hey, why don't you come along with us? We're going to go here, we're going to go there. And what we say, we say, we, 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 we say, no, we don't say no, it's against my beliefs. We say, we, we say things like, um, you know, I, I don't feel well today, maybe next week. <laughs> maybe next time. We, we, we him and harm our way through. Instead of just saying, you know what, it's against my beliefs, it's against my conviction, I'm not going to be going. We don't really establish the fact that it's a spiritual issue that needs to be addressed. And what amazing to me, brothers and sisters, is that Daniel was about 15 years old. That's the range. He was a teenager, about 15 years old. And he made a stand for God. Can we make a stand for God like that, church? Can we make a stand for God this morning? Daniel used the word defiled in the Old Testament. He used the word defiled. In the Old Testament, it was something that was an abomination. Abomination to the Lord. And so the king's food, he says, was an abomination. I cannot have that. Why? Why would the king's food defile him? Well, firstly, the meat usually was offered to an idol. So Daniel said, I can't have that. Second thing, second thing is that if they ate it, they would have been defiled because it wasn't prepared according to the Jewish dietary law in Leviticus chapter 11. There were so many things that they could not eat. And if certain things that they did eat, it had to be prepared in a certain way. So he says, I can't have it. It's amazing to me in church to see someone in the midst of a very tough situation, not being afraid, being so convicted, standing upon the word of God, and does not uh, compromise his belief. Did the church say that? He wasn't ashamed of God. He wasn't ashamed of his belief. Even in the midst of a pagan society, he would not give in. Even if he, he knew that it was a possibility that he would have been thrown into jail. He knew it was a possibility that he would have been worse. He would have been killed. But Daniel was committed to God regardless of his surroundings. Proverbs 20, 29 and verse 25, the Bible said, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Yeah. Amen. A lot of people fear men and what they will do to the body. We, we, sometimes we fear. But Daniel did not fear man. Amen. A true man of God will not fear man, but he will fear God. God said, do not fear the one who can, can hurt the body. But the fear of the one can, 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 can earn the, the both body and spirit into hell. I think about God fearing men like Moses, who just walked up to fear in Exodus chapter 5, verse number 1, and he says, What? Let my people go. I think of God the men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, 16 through 18, when they were told to bow down to the golden image. And what did they do? In verse 16, it says, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter, verse 17. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able, amen, to deliver us, amen. Our God, church, is able to deliver us, amen. He says he's able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us, wow, from your hand. He says, oh, King, verse 18, but we will not serve your gods, nor the golden image you have set up. They were unwilling to compromise church. 
And Daniel says, I will, and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, I will not. I will not bow down. God feared men like Peter and John, who was bold before the Sanhedrin, when they told him to what? Be quiet. Stop speaking about this Jesus. And what did they do? The Bible says in Acts 4 and verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, in their school, by the way, they marveled. They said, wow. And they realized that they have been with Jesus. When people look at you, can they tell that you've been with Jesus? When they look at me, can they tell that I've been with Jesus? They were bold and they would not compromise their, their life. Verse number 19 through 20, the Bible says, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it's right with in the sight of God to listen to you, or to you more than, than, than of God, you judge, verse 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and which we have heard. Let the church say amen. amen. Church, we have to come to the point of maturity, brother read as well, where we stand up for truth. Let the church say amen. amen. Where we have the courage to draw the line where God draws, draws the line, where we say no, where we are bold about the truth, no matter how dangerous the situation may be, where we say we cannot do that because we belong to God, which leads us to our next point. When we as Christians stand up for truth, when we do not compromise our beliefs, God will protect you. Amen. God will protect you. Point number two, an unearthly protection. Verse number nine. The Bible continues and says, verse nine, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill with the chief of eunuchs. Amen. Now you know, and I know, when anyone establish a standard like Daniel, you can best believe that God will protect you. Amen. Amen. When you stand up for truth, God will protect you. God responds to this type of commitment, church. A commitment that does not waver. A commitment that does not vacillate. A commitment that does not hesitate to tell the truth in love. Praise the Lord. The Bible says God worked on the heart of the official so that he showed Daniel favor. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. God can even turn your enemies into your friends, if you will. Amen. He can cause your enemies to show you favor. And that's what we see with Israel. Israel, Egypt showed them favor when they were leaving. And it always goes like that. God will make your enemies show you favor. I think even if people disagree with your conviction, they would admire, admire you because you take a stand. Let the church say amen. amen. You take a stand for what is right. People don't like, as we say in Jamaica, we should wash the people, right? <laughs> we say in Jamaica, people don't like people who are afraid to take a stand. On the other hand, we like people who are morally strong, if you will. People who respect themselves. People who have integrity to say what they mean and mean what they say. say. Amen. Amen. However, church, it wasn't Daniel integrity. It wasn't Daniel's strong morals that swayed the official. Yes, I believe that Daniel had an awesome personality. I believe, yes, Daniel was articulate. But it wasn't Daniel's ability to articulate his words to the official that swayed the official's heart. It was God. Let the church say amen. amen. It was God who intervened when we have success in life, church. Who do we give the credit to? God. It was God who stepped in and changed that, that, that official's heart. The Bible says in, 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 in Psalms 51, David says, Create in me a pure heart, O oh God. It is God who works on men's heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 16, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but who gave the increase, church? God gave the increase. Brothers and sisters, God is in the heart changing business. Let the church say amen. amen. This was an act of God. God was in control of the situation. 
God is in control right now. Let the church say amen. amen. And God can change it around for you this morning. Amen. amen. God is in the heart changing uh, business. God controls everything. God took control of this situation. You know, sometimes, church, if you want to get somewhere, you don't have to play politics. Okay. Amen. Amen. You don't have to play politics to get ahead. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You don't need to compromise. Amen. Amen. All you need to do is trust God. Amen. And God will put you there. And if God put you there, there's no one that can take you from there. Let the church say amen. amen. you got to put your trust in God. And I think of Joseph. Joseph, like Daniel, they run like parallel in the book, in the scriptures. Joseph, also like Daniel, was in a foreign land. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, if you remember the story. And what happens to him? He ends up becoming what? The prime minister. The prime minister of Egypt. Both Joseph and Daniel was in foreign countries. Both of them possessed extraordinary prophetic power. Both of them was elevated to, to second in command. And both of them trust God Amen. and did not compromise. Amen. Amen. You see, church, you don't need to compromise to get on the top. Amen. You don't need to compromise to get on the top. If, you want, if God wants you there, he will put you there. He will put you there. And when God puts you there, there's no one that can take you from there. Let the church say amen. amen. How many times I've seen that. When God puts you there, there's no man that can take you from there. Because God is the one that's in control. Let the church say amen. amen. But if you compromise and you get to the top, guess what? You're by yourself there. <laughs> because God didn't put you there. <laughs> if God wants to lift you up in society, he will. Amen. If God wants to lift you up in a church, he will. If God wants to lift you up in a ministry, he will. If God wants to lift you up in a job, praise the Lord, he will. If God wants to lift you up in any situation, what God wants you to do is live an uncompromising life. Let the church say amen. And what's awesome, brothers and sisters, is that when we know that God is with us in this situation, it strengthens our faith. When you know you're doing good and God is blessing you and you know that God is with you, what does it do to you? It strengthens your faith, isn't it? Doesn't it? It strengthens my faith. Which leads us to our last point this morning. The Bible continues and says, verse 11 to 13. The Bible says, follow me please. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, <coughs> Azariah, verse 20, he said, the Bible says, Please test your servant for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our parents be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portions of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servant. In other words, Daniel says, put us to the test. Put us to the test for ten days, only give us vegetable and water. Now, this is not for you to go home and go drink water and vegetable by yourself, okay? <laughs> but that, but this, here God intervened, okay? So he said, put us to the test. Give us only vegetables and water. And then compare us with the other young men. And see who look, who look more healthy. Daniel says, put us to the test. The word test carries the meaning of to prove what one says. In other words, Daniel says, I will prove it to you in 10 days. Come back and check upon us in 10 days. Now, where did Daniel get his confidence? Well, I believe when a person lives a holy life, when a person lives a life that's pleasing to God, there's a sense of invincibility. Because you know that you're doing what God would have you to do. Amen. Regardless of where real life turns, you know, if you're doing what God would have you to do, it's a sense of invincibility. Because you know that you have God behind you. Amen. Yes. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all we can imagine, ask or, or, or think according to his power that's working in us. Amen. Amen. We know we got, we got the full force of God with us. 
We got God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church say amen. amen. So what do we have to worry about? And so Daniel had an unblemished faith. That means he operated, you know, in any trials. <clears throat> he was able to stand in any trouble. He was able to stand in the midst of danger, and you can too. And as long as your heart is right before God, there is nothing that you can fear. There is nothing to fear because God is with you. Let the church say amen. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? No one can be against you if God is for you. Let the church say amen. God says in Isaiah Chapter 43 and verse number 2, he says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, praise the Lord. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. He was really confident. Question, church, are you confident in God's power? Are we confident in God's power? That whatever situation that you're going through, he's able to bring you through? Well, Daniel was. Daniel was a man of faith. He says, I will walk out on the end of the plank. I will take my stand on God's word. And if, and if I don't compromise and defile myself, God will honor me. And that's what Daniel did. And that's an unblemished faith. The blessings of an uncompromising life is an unashamed boldness, an unearthly protection, and an unblemished faith. Jesus also had the same characteristics, the same thing. Jesus also had an unashamed boldness. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, he spoke with authority, the Bible says. When Jesus spoke, he spoke with boldness. And because of how Jesus spoke, they did not like him. They, they, they plotted against him to take his life. Jesus also had an unearthly protection. God, his father, was looking out for him. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 17, I believe verse 5, if I'm not mistaken, that God says, when Peter and John was there on the mountain of transfiguration, he says, this is my son whom I love. He says what? To him I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Take your mind off everyone else. Listen to Jesus. Jesus had an unearthly protection. Jesus says, my father is still working at this moment. He has not left me alone. Right? Jesus also had an unblemished faith. Jesus trusted God. Trusted the Father. Trusted the process. He knew that once he continued to trust, everything is going to work out. Amen. 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 He got the I's and he crossed the T's. Okay. He did everything that Daniel could not do. He fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies and the prophets, the law. He did everything. He, 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 he spoke the way he was supposed to speak. Yeah. He think the things that he was supposed to think. Yeah. The things that he wasn't supposed to think, he did not think. God, Jesus, lived a perfect life. And that's the reason why, amen. And that's the reason why he is our faithful substitute. He is our faithful high priest. He takes our place and he bore our sins upon the cross. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. He died, he was buried, but Jesus rose again. Amen. 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 And he rose again upon the first day of the week. Praise the Lord. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28, and I believe we're on verse number 5. Matthew chapter 28, and verse number 5. That the ladies went there to see the sepulchre. But guess what? The sepulchre was empty. Because Jesus rose from the grave. The Bible says in verse 1, Now after the Sabbath has dawned, the Sabbath, as the first day of the week, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. 
He said his countenance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know you seek Jesus who was, who was crucified. Amen. That's the past. Jesus Christ, our Savior, he died on the cross for our, for our sins. He was suspended between heaven and earth. Rejected by both because of our sins. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned, Romans 3 and verse number 23. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died, but also he rose from the grave. The Bible tells us in verse number 5, he says, But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the evidence. Come see the place that he lays. He's not here anymore. He is risen. He did what we couldn't do. And that is rise from the dead. That means that he is our faithful our high priest. That he is our king. Romans chapter 1, I believe, and verse number 4. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 4. And then the sermon is yours. The Bible says, And he declared to be the Son of God. Amen. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Amen. we got an awesome Savior. Amen. Our Savior died in Savior. He died and was buried. But he also rose again upon the first day of the week. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. In order for one to be a Christian and to be a part of the body of Christ, one must be a part of the church. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that all, all spiritual blessings are where? Located in Christ. in Christ. Amen. So in order for you to have that spiritual blessing, in order for you to have that 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 ability to communicate effectively to God you have to be in Christ Jesus right now people have to pray for you but once you're in Christ you can pray for yourself because now you are a child of God right you are a priest right so one must hear the word faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God that's Romans 10 17 one must believe the word Mark 16 16 one must confess Jesus Christ as the son of God one must repent, turn away from one's sin. One must be baptized. Acts 2.38. What's the purpose of baptism? To wash away one's sins. One must, it's imperative, to live faithful until death. That's Revelation 2.10. When Jesus Christ comes back, he's promised that heaven will be your home. As we stand and sing a song of encouragement.